So we have with us uh, Beth Macy, who is a Virginia journalist. She's written about the opioids crisis since 2012. She'll be talking today about dope sick dealers, doctors, and the drug company that addicted America. It won the LA Times Book Prizes as, and is in production as a forthcoming limited series on Hulu. Uh, Eric Iyer is an investigative reporter at Mountain State Spotlight. He is also the author of Death in Mud Lick, a coal country fight against the drug companies that delivered the opioid epidemic, which recently won a, the top book award from, <clears throat> excuse me, investigative reporters and editors. He previously worked as a reporter at the Charleston Gazette Mail in uh, West Virginia, where in 2017, he won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting for his reporting on opioids. Finally, we have with us Charlotte Bismuth, who started her legal career at the firm of uh, Deba Voice, Plimpton LLP, and joined the New York County District Attorney's Office in 20, 2008. After prosecuting the landmark case of People versus Lee, uh, she wrote her book based on the case, Bad Medicine, Catching New York's Deadliest Pill Pushers. So um, Eric is going to, uh, or Beth is going to talk about um, her early coverage on opioids, which led, led to her book. Eric's gonna talk about some sources uh, that you can tap for, for data and, and legal decisions. And he'll talk about his coverage. And then Charlotte's gonna give us a, an overview of some of the key legal theories at play here and talk about kind of the scope of the opioids cases around the country. Um, I'm, I'm, expect, I'm glad we have this, this, this lineup here. These are their these are the three books, um, all compelling reads. I would suggest um, if you're going to be involved in this coverage going forward, you know you should you should grab them from your your local independent bookstore or big evil Amazon, whichever one. Um, so let's go to Beth first. We'll we'll go to Beth Macy, and each each of them are going to talk for you know 12, 15 minutes or so, um, and then we'll have time for a general Q and A with all of them. If you have a question. You know, specific to Beth that you want to, you know, that pops to your mind as she's talking. You know, we can take a few questions in between each of the sessions. But we're all we're all writers here in the room now, um, and so, you know, what we just want a nice kind of informal discussion. So, you know, if you have a question, you know, pop your hand up and we'll work it in. But I'll turn it over to Beth. Great, thank you so much for having me. It's a thrill to be here, and especially to be in the same space as two of my heroes, Eric and Charlotte. Um, they've just been so kind and they're such great colleagues and, um, and uh, kudos to you all for applying for this fellowship. Some of my best training that I've ever had in my 30 some year career has been through programs just like this. Um, I'm gonna talk for five minutes about Dope Sick, five minutes or so about my current project was a, which is a follow up to Dope Sick. And then I've got four or five just kind of takeaway bits of advice I want to end with. So I was a longtime newspaper reporter at the Roanoke Times, live in a quarter, a city of about a quarter million. Um, I was the family's beat reporter in 2012. Now, before that, I had a lot of seniority and I did a lot of writing about trauma. I had done a lot of uh, narrative series around big issues like immigration, veterans with PTSD, poverty in the inner city. I mean, those kind of stories were really my jam. I grew up poor. I was the first person in my family to go to college. And those kind of stories, when, when those themes meet with my own story, uh, that's when I do my best work. And I know that now. It took me a while to figure it out. Um, but the big story on everybody's mind in 2012 was the fact that heroin had exploded. And not in the inner city, but actually in the wealthiest suburb in Roanoke County. And the way it exploded was on the front page of the paper, this wealthy kid, son of a prominent uh, woman who had a chain of jewelry stores in town and had been in office. Um, her, her kid was about to go to prison for his role in selling the heroin to a former private school classmate who died. So he was about to go to federal prison for, for three or five years. And I did a three part series that ran like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday that told the story. And readers kind of literally spit up the coffee that they were drinking when they read the story. They're like, what? Wealthy white kids do heroin? And, um, and I knew there was a much bigger story to tell, but this is, this is 2012. 
after that story, literally, I wrote my first book, Factory Man, which was about the aftermath of globalization. It was my first book. I was 50 years old, had to learn how to do book writing, but it was basically the same skills. And what I was writing about then were dis distressed communities where uh, the jobs had all gone away. And at the end of my reporting, I realized that heroin and meth were overtaking these communities, but it didn't really put the story together with the, with the, um, with the introduction of Oxycontin in 1996 until later. Um, you might recall that in 2015, Deaton and Case did their landmark study about deaths of despair, saying that for the first time in American history, life expectancy was going down. And that's kind of when we first started seeing that. And then the book Dreamland came out in 2016, I think, maybe 15. And by then, people were starting to get the connection. So I actually had proposed Dope Sick be my second book. My editor and my agent in New York, they're like, Roanoke's getting heroin? We had heroin in the 90s here. Like, you're just slow getting it. Like, it was a trend or something. So they said no. Uh, so I kept it in my back pocket because I knew that it was something that didn't go away, right? Like that's the why it's called dope sick. It's because it's not because they want to get high. It's because once those dopamines get flooded with opioids, they have to have it in order not to be sick. And I'm sure you've learned all about the science of that. But anyway, so I just I, I talked them into letting me do it as my third book, and I did what I always did. I cast my net wide. I ended up going to back to my sources that I had built in 2012. I went back to a federal prosecutor. He told me about this case. Uh, he had just prosecuted the largest heroin dealer ever, two hours north of here. He pulled out this chart that said F-U-B-I, and it was, it was all the layers of this drug ring. And some of the people's names were crossed out because they had died. And he had just put away the guy at the top named Ronnie Jones. And I just became super interested in that chart. And I was like, uh, will you let me take a picture of it? No, uh, tell me more about it. And then I tracked down, eventually over time, I tracked down the people in the chart and I eventually tracked down Ronnie Jones and I eventually figured out why the chart was called FUBI, which I tell about in the book. Um, so I cast my net wide. I ended up settling on three stories. One was kind of this Ronnie Jones story, which allowed me to talk about mass incarceration and just like the revolving door. The second was how we got here. And that story, luckily for me, kind of began in um, places in Appalachia, which are not too far from here. And I took my good friend, Lawrence Hemmick, who had covered OxyContin um, and especially that first case that uh, ended on 07, I took him out for coffee and I said, Lawrence, tell me about this. And I just did what Lawrence told me to do. I read everything he told me to read. I went to the people that were first dealing with the issue who were fighting against the company and nobody had contacted them. Nobody went back to say, how are we doing now? And how they were doing now was not good. I mean, we're talking about a 70 year old doctor who was the first to call Purdue on the phone and say, we got a crisis brewing here in 1999 now works 14 hours a week. We're talking about an 80 some year old uh, drug counselor and nun who also works 14 hour days. Um, they were just bombarded with the problem of addiction in the community. And so I knew that was a story that through them and some of their patients that I would be able to tell the origin story. At the same time, really through dumb luck, through a family friend, I met this young woman named Tess Henry, who was kind of affiliated with the, the story I told you that began all this. So she, she was a doctor's daughter, a nurse's daughter, vacation home, all the elements you would think would have the resources to fight back against this. And yet I watched her story unfold for two years. And every time she lost access to her medication assisted treatment, her, she sunk deeper until she ended up uh, on the other side of the country prostituting and selling drugs so as not to be dope sick. And um, the story was all written up. The book was edited, fact checked. It was legal reviewed. And then I got a call that I had been dreading since the very beginning on the day after Christmas that they had found her body in the bottom of a dumpster. She had been murdered on Christmas Eve. And so um, I got the ending of the story I didn't want to write. And um, I learned so much from her story. So the 
the challenge of the story was like, you got these three disparate stories. How do I make them stand in for all of America? How do I make them sort of, you know, anybody can relate to it. It's a, it's a story that I can kind of drive to all these places, but I want the person in Washington and Seattle to be able to get it too. And so, you know, I wrote about rich, poor, rich people, poor people, white and black, treatment providers, families, and mostly try to keep the focus on the people who were being abandoned, both by their families and the systems that were supposed to uh, help them. And it just so happened that the three of them were sort of loosely connected by I-81, which is an interstate that runs through Virginia, and also the same way the, the drugs traveled. I gotta be honest, the biggest challenge was, um, I, I told you I'd done a lot of trauma reporting. I'd never, I'd never been to a funeral home with a mother who was saying goodbye to her battered daughter. And I knew them both really well. I had never experienced trauma of this kind. When, when the book came out, I told my editor, I never wanna write about this again. I really needed a break. I had to get asked for some mental health help um, and I got it and I'm not ashamed of it. And, um, but then as I went all over the country talking about the book, I started to see good things that were happening. And now the new book is kind of focused on solutions. So as the story was, Tessa's story, that third story I told you about was unfolding before me, I had to be nimble. So I cast my net wide. I pick the people whose stories move me the most. I always tell students, if it doesn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck the first time you hear it, find a story that does. Um, and I was very transparent with my subjects. I told Tess the first time I met her at her mother's house, I, I'm not even, I hadn't even written the proposal yet. So I, I don't know if you'll be in the book, but I know I'll learn a lot from you about this issue from following your story. And she never wavered. She never didn't let me talk to her. But I had to just keep filling her in with where I was with the book as the story unfolded. The biggest compliment I got uh, from the book, which I think is what inspires me to do this work still, so a person in recovery came up to me and said, until your book, till I read your book, I didn't understand that I was a part of a larger story. I thought I was just a fuck up. So I think that motivates all of us here today, like to tell this story so that people will understand where the biggest gaps in care are. You know, we still have like a 10% treatment gap, 90% uh, treatment gap, only 10% of folks with SUD get, get help. And many of them don't get the help the science says is the best. So what I'm doing with the, the next book I'm working on is I've kind of picked three or four, I, I know I need, or five, I need to winnow it down to three stories that I wanna follow under similar vein. And I really wanna hold up the people on the ground that are trying to help these folks um, by meeting them where they are, some harm reduction, some activists that are working on the lawsuits, Charlotte's been helping me a bit with that piece, um, some innovators in the criminal justice system who are doing some really cool things. I spent a week recently with a nurse practitioner who drives around, um, the former furniture belt of North Carolina, which is where a lot of my first book, Factory Man, was set, doing things like hepatitis C pizza parties where he tests people in under bridges, in tents, in, in trap houses. I mean, it's just like, talk about making the hair stand up on your neck. So Here's my few little takeaways, um, and I'm happy to answer questions either now or, or after. Um, follow what moves you. If it doesn't make the hair stand up on your neck, keep going until you find the story that does, because if you're moved, you're gonna be able to move your reader. And um, you know, I, I get a lot of Facebook messages from families who are in this space right now, and they'll say, oh God, I wish I would read your book before. I didn't really understand what my person was going through. Um, Keep up with people, even if it's just over the phone or text or Facebook. Um, I mean, I've always done that in my career because I love people and I love the people I write about. But by the time I was writing a book four years later about the heroin uh, opioid epidemic, I had all these sources in my pocket because I kept up with them, including, you know, Spencer and his mother, the, you know, that first family had written back in 2012. And, and you learned a lot from that story. Um, you know, I was, I was there when he got out of prison. Um, 
I love to like really follow people for a long time, which we don't always get to do as journalists. But I think if we can make time, we can meet with somebody even just once, but then we can keep up with them over text, over phone, over Facebook. Um, I, I try to go deep with people first, with real people who are the most affected by any issue. And then I back up and I call around for experts in, in the fields, in history. So for this new book, um, I tracked down the father of harm reduction, the person who first invented it in San Francisco, the free clinic in the Haight-Ashbury. Um, and I knew that because that nurse practitioner was a follower of his. And when I asked him what inspired him, he said, oh, this guy started this free clinic in 1967. And so I found him and I interviewed him and he was like in his 80s and he was so cool. And I learned a lot about the history of it. I mean, I, ha I now have kind of a, a lot of scholars in this work and I keep up with them too, a medical anthropologist, an addictions professor at Harvard. Um, I interviewed an expert on cultural change because so much of what I've witnessed in these communities that I'm writing about, it's not that they don't know the science or have access to the science, it's that they don't even care to look at the science, right? So how do we get people to change their minds about things? I'm, I'm really interested in that. Um, two more points, uh, find your team, your people who you call for when you're down about your work. Um, when I got my edits back on Dope Sick, I literally couldn't sleep for two days. I was in a mad panic. I called my friend Martha, who's a healthcare reporter in Boston. She talked me down. She said, oh, honey, you don't have time to have a panic attack. She said, I want you to print out a picture of somebody you wrote about that you love who died. And remember that we have X number of people dying every day. You don't have time for a panic attack. And then not only that, she read my editor's notes and helped me figure out what was really important. I mean, that is a friend for life, right? I have other friends who are journalists and you gotta build your team, especially when you're early in your career. My husband's a great, my editor wanted me to take chapter 13 and turn it into the prologue. I'm like, ooh. And my husband said, well, what about when you were driving to prison to interview him? What did you see along the way? What did you pass? Like what was going on in your mind? And it turned out, it's my favorite part of the book, but you know, it was a lot of pain tears and suffering to get to that. And my team really helped me figure that out. Um, listen to your critics. I had written a piece early on for the New York Times about buprenorphine. I titled the piece, The Box Wars. Um, there's a lot of cash only clinics in Appalachia that take advantage of the people just the way the, pay mill, uh, the pill mills did in the early years. And I got hammered for that piece, even though I said it was the gold standard, blah, blah, blah. And, but I ended up talking to the people who hammered me and I learned a lot from them and it helped me kind of understand this sticky wicket that I was getting myself into. But I think as a younger journalist, I would have been too defensive to hear them. So you wanna, you wanna approach your critics with an open heart and spirit too. I just had another one of my experts, a Stanford addiction professor, you know, I told her what I was writing about and she was like, oh, Beth, you don't want to look back in five years and say you did a book uh, celebrating harm reductionists. And I'm like, mm, I think I might. And, um, but then I wanted to like, why does she think that? And what can I learn from her different point of view? So that's what I always try to do. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or wait till later, whatever you think, Chris. Thank you, so, Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's just go to um, any any quick questions for Beth before we move on. We can always we'll come back after we've heard from all three of them. I've got qu one quickly, Beth. Sure. You, know, you, you kind of hinted at it right at the end there. I'm with uh, Gray Television's DC Bureau. Um, when it comes to the medical science that is just beyond your understanding. And there's either a disagreement in the field or disagreement between medical professionals and, and some of the, the pharma folks. How do you try to, to get beyond just he said, she said? How do, you, how do you try to get to the bottom of something where you don't have the scientific background to do so? Um, I just ask a lot of dumb questions. And I mean, a lot of the science in this is, is settled, right? It's, it's just, to me, it's more like, it's that the people won't look at the science in, in the communities I'm writing about. Like, so you're outside of DC. One of the places I visited recently was the Fairfax County Jail. They're doing 
uh, buprenorphine in the jail. They have peers come in while they're in jail, even during COVID, uh, and then they pick them up when they get out. I mean, it's incredible. And yet, in all these other places that I'm writing about, it's just the jails are three times as full as they uh, should be. Um, they won't do buprenorphine in the jail and they won't even look at it. That's why I wanna to get to that piece about how do you change people's minds in places where they have, where the, cause the sheriffs are so powerful in this nation, right? They're like their own little daily wigs. Um, how, how do I get the sheriff in Fairfax who has nothing in common with the sheriff in Surrey County, North Carolina? How do I get, you know, how do I figure out how to bridge that gap because people are really suffering in this jail. And they actually gave me a tour of the jail so I could see people being dope sick in the intake area. And, and to them, they weren't even ashamed of it as, as I was for them because they thought, uh, you know, what the truth is they wanna build a bigger jail. So, so it extends their power and their money and all that. Um, but they didn't even wanna look at the science. So, um, but when something's really complicated, I mean, I just, if somebody's not explaining me to it to me in a way I can understand it, I'll try to find somebody else who can. Uh, I'll, I'm not afraid to ask dumb questions. I mean, I've even used that Denzel Washington line, tell it to me like I'm a third grader. I mean, that's pretty effective. I'm not afraid to humble myself and say, I don't get it. Um, and uh, I just keep piecing at it. I mean, I can't wait. I'm going to be taking notes when, when Charlotte speaks because I still don't understand. And when Eric speaks about these, these cases, and it's important that I understand it. And I, I mean, I wrote a book about the freaking opioid crisis, and, uh, but a lot of it's over my head. Um, but you just got to keep trying until you get it. Okay, well, let's do one more question. Quick question from Georgia, then we'll go on to Eric. Hi, thank you so much uh, uh, for being here. I was just wondering how you um, how you realized that you needed um, some mental health help of your own and um, what that looked like. Oh, that's, that, thank you for asking. I really don't mind talking about it. So I, I did a fellowship called the DART, uh, the DART fellowship, it's out, out of Columbia. Um, so, so it was on my radar. And I really have always written about trauma in one way or another. And I know Frank Ochberg, he's, the fellowship is in his name. We're friends. He, he founded it. He helped get the first funding for it. He is the psychiatrist who wrote the DSM guide for PTSD back in the 70s. We're friends. And as I was getting ready to have Dopesick come out, I mean, the legal review it took a week. It was excruciating. And the publisher was nervous. I mean, the subtitle is Dealers, Doctors, and the Drug Maker that and the Drug Company that Addicted America. And I was like, company? Don't I want to say companies? And my editor's like, well, you just write about Purdue. I mean, that was freaking intimidating. And then every, you know how it is working with families who are in trauma, every family, like it was a negotiation. And I'm willing to do that hard work of like, okay, I won't say this and this, but it has to be true. So how can we get to, to yes on, on this true matter, right? So I really like know my people, I worry about them. Um, I showed some of them the drafts, um, but there were still people who were mad at me at the end. And so it's just a lot to deal with. And so I called my friend Frank and I said, you know, cause I had gone to the doctor and I said, I can't sleep. I'm having panic attacks. And he said, uh, I think you should go to a psychiatrist. And um, so I called Frank first, this is my free psychiatrist. And Frank said, I don't think you have PTSD. I think you're, you have anxiety. Uh, and then I, and that just made me feel like everything would be okay. And then um, and then I went to the psychiatrist and he put me on antidepressants and um, uh, <laughs> I had saw, I had seen a counselor before and it's always been work stress with me um, in my career. And I went to her too. I went back to her and she goes, I don't know how you do it. She, she said, I had to stop seeing patients who were addicted to heroin because it was losing too many of them. And I just thought, whoa, when your counselor won't even write, uh, deal with this um, and then can't help you. With, she, she did help me with the book. But, you know, just 
have friends you can talk to about it, have colleagues, have hopefully this fellowship that you're in. You know, you now know people that you trust. I spoke to some of my dark fellows that I've stayed in touch with. We would speak about it um, from time to time. And, and I always try to make, there's like, once you've done a dark fellowship, you're sort of in that fraternity. And, and because I'm one of those people that will help others, not about the opioid crisis, but other trauma reporters, you know, they help me too. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Beth. So let's move on to Eric. Eric, welcome and look, looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Well, uh, first off, um, do everything that Beth just said, put the people first. <laughs> <laughs> put the people first, but I'm here to talk about numbers to kind of supplement your story. And I know we're taught as journalists to be really careful with a lot of numbers. Um, but in this case, the the numbers are reported by companies, and, and we're going to talk about um, pain pill numbers here, and they're reported by the uh, companies, so uh, uh, they're the ones doing that, so uh, it's hard to dispute what numbers they've reported. Well, the first one, www.slcg.com, that's um, a nationwide database of all prescription opioids that have been sent to every pharmacy, every hospital, by distributor, by county, by individual pharmacies across the country. Um, that, that, that was um, put together, that database was put together by um, the plaintiff's lawyers in a nationwide lawsuit where they're suing distributors and distributors being the companies that are sort of the middlemen and distribute from the manufacturer to the pharmacy but it's against distributors and manufacturers. Um, they also have like total number of pills broken down by manufacturers and which manufacturers sent to which distributors. So it's, it's a really comprehensive database. I actually um, covering the, the, the court, they call it the Bell where their opi opiate trial, we see that at the bottom, the city of Huntington, West Virginia and Cabell County, West Virginia, Huntington is the county seat, are suing uh, in this case, three distributors uh, Mayor Source Bergen, Cardinal Health, and McKesson, and it's being actually going ongoing right now. At two o'clock, I'll be back in the in the courtroom. And this data was was introduced as part of that case and the the national case. And earlier this week, uh, I, when I was sitting through uh, three days of testimony from the guy that put this database together, and was by the way was paid three million dollars to put it together. <laughs> Uh, so we bet somebody better use it. Um, he said he had a team of Caltech graduates and like 11 people working on this to put it together. Uh, and why it's sort of the, the gold standard here of data is because he took the DEA data and then he also took data directly from the drug distributors and manufacturers as part of uh, what they call discovery. Uh, the, the, the records that they turned over. And it's basically, I think it's got uh, more than 500 million uh, fields. And he, he found, um, of the, in those fields, he found 10 million uh, errors. And then uh, he compared that with, by comparing that with the, what the drug distributors had given them. So it's supposed to be pretty clean at this point. There, there may be a few errors in there, but uh, for the most part, it's sort of, like I said, the gold standard. Um, and what it is, it's the shipments from 2006 to 2014. Originally, this was held under seal. Uh, my former newspaper, the Gazette Mail, a lawyer out of Morgantown named Pat McGinley, um, we got together and got this idea of, because this was part of a uh, public court case that we could get this DE, Drug Enforcement Administration data and use it. We had gotten a sliver of this data for the story that won the Pulitzer Prize, and that was just the West Virginia data from 2007 to 2012. So much, much smaller data set. And um, basically we went to court, the federal judge ruled against us uh, the first time around, and I thought we were done, but our uh, free lawyers uh, went to uh, Cincinnati and, and uh, okay. Oh, wow, you got it, okay. Yeah, it's real. I'll talk a second about how easy after I talk about this. So they went to uh, the Fourth Circuit in Cincinnati. They appealed, and we won on appeal. And the judge changed 
it then granted us access to this data. Um, it came in as 500, you know, 500 million entries. Uh, the raw data, we got the raw data the first day and I couldn't do anything with it on my 10 year old laptop at home. Um, we even called, or nobody in the, the newsroom had any capacity to handle this amount of data. And uh, the Washington Post eventually got the data as well. They were, they teamed up, uh, one of their lawyers out of Akron, Ohio, teamed up with our lawyers. And they, I, from what I've read, they've actually had to buy some sort of new computer that could handle, even the data team at the Washington Post had to go out and buy something to handle it. And we'll get into theirs in a second. But if, as you can see on the, the slide there, thanks for putting that up. It's this, this data is, it's, it's, it's so easy to use. Um, you can click on the, where it says select here down on the bottom left uh, on a state, and then you can go into a county. You can see like which particular counties have the pharmacies in those particular counties have the highest number of, oh, yep, Delaware, District of Columbia, yeah, Florida. Um, you can go in there and, you know, by county and get a full report. Not only do they give you, I believe it's uh, 10 or 11 different prescription opioids, but they also give you uh, what's called MMEs or morphine milligram equivalents. And that's strength of drugs. That's like, you know, the, the stronger pills. If, you, if you're dealing in milligrams, you might have a five milligram hydrocodone and then a 10 and a 15 or, you know, oxys, uh, oxycontin, same thing, uh, you know, the, the higher the dose, the higher the morphine milligram equivalent is going to be. So you can see, you know, you can divide it up that way. They also have links to getting the raw data. Um, I've never done that. Uh, that's way, that's, that's uh, way out of my league. Uh, maybe not out of Chris's back in his day. This is the kind of stuff that he did. Um, and so you can get your county, you can find out, you can do things like you can find out, you know, which were the top uh, dispensing pharmacies in, in your particular county. You can find out which distributors sent the most pills, pain pills to your county. Um, you can look at the top, uh, 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 distributors by your entire state. You can you can rank the top pharmacies in your state by total number of pills dispensed. And one little warning on that one: the data, some of the data, includes um, the what, what we call long-term care facilities, where people are, uh, you know, in in nursing homes and, and the like, and they may have like a pharmacy affiliated with that, and that would show up. Uh, as, as like your number one pharmacy. And that's probably not a fair comparison because for end of life issues and everything, there's obviously gonna be more pain and, and more opioids. But, um, you know, if you're looking, if you're scrolling down and you see stuff like in West Virginia, we have had pharmacies like called like Larry's drive Through Pharmacy, Meds to Go Express, uh, Family Discount Pharmacy. Um, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I found I, my book surrounded a pharmacy in uh, Mingo County, Kermit, West Virginia, that had sold like 30, 12 million uh, hydrocodone pills over the course of three years. And I thought that was the number one pharmacy. But when I got on here, I found there's actually a pharmacy that hardly has ever been written about in a nearby county called Logan or Family Discount Pharmacy. It actually was the highest in our state. So you can look again at, you know, what are the highest in the state? Um, what I'd recommend to that, there's, it's real easy to use if you just start playing around on it. Um, be careful that you don't use the MME instead of the pill, which is, I've done that on Twitter before. Uh, it's, it's two separate things, but, uh, and the MMEs are much larger numbers. Now, the Washington Post site, is very good and they did a great public service. They got theirs up a lot quicker um, than this. And you can, um, I think you still have to go through the paywall though, but um, they've got things where they've already done some of the number crunching. You can see uh, 
Oh, and it's also limited. The Washington Post is limited to hydrocodone and oxycodone. So there's just two drugs. And they're the two largest uh, sellers, is hydrocodone and oxycodone, which is the generic for uh, OxyContin. Um, yeah, so they, 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 they have it broken down uh, more. They already have some, you know, you can just quickly look. You don't have to scroll through anything. You can see which is your highest dispensing pharmacy in, in, the, in the state. Um, I was just playing around with it the other day, and I found one in, like, North Dakota that was, like, four or five times the number of opioid pills as any. It was a small, I think it was in Fargo. Um, or no. Bismarck, I don't know. I don't know my North, Car North Dakota towns. Um, so you could look at uh, you could look at all those, um, and and you know see which is the the largest. Yeah, there's the Washington Post database. Um, it's again, it's 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 broken down. I, I assume it's close to. I, I did check the other day, and the numbers are different when you look at particular pharmacies. Um, I don't know why that is. I don't know if there's this, these 10 million errors that were in there, or um, sometimes they, I don't know if they sh struck out the pharmacies at the post um, that were like affiliated with hospitals, but it, it'll give you, it'll give you pretty good numbers. Um, kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, uh, CDC stuff, you guys probably know already a lot of this if you cover health, but the one the CDC wonder database, you can do uh, drug overdose death counts by a particular type of drug, if you want to do that, illicit and prescription drugs. I haven't used that in a couple of years, but um, it, back when I was uh, reporting on a daily basis about drug overdoses. I was constantly on that site. Uh, you can do it by year, you know, the year spread and um, just a lot of, you might want to do some sort of tutorial on it with somebody before you really dive into it because there's all sorts of drug codes. And actually I was working with, back when we did the article that won the Pulitzer, I was working with some of the West Virginia uh, the, the Bureau of Statistics uh, to help me with the Wonder database because there's always some epidemiologist that knows this like the back of their hand to find uh, and they're always willing to help you. Um, number four, the, uh, this is a real easy one. It's the CDC Vital Statistics. Oh, I misspelled statistics. <laughs> okay. Uh, Vital Statistics Rapid Response Drug Overdose Deaths. And what this does, it'll give you a state-by-state state count uh, of reported and projected deaths by month over a 12-month period. And what they're at right now is October 2019 to October 2020. It changes every month. So next month, it'll be like November 2019 to November 2020. But this really... This is data collected from the statistics centers in each state. So it's, it's been pretty uh, on the mark every time. And it was the first, this is where we got the first glimpse of how much the, uh, the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic had impacted the uh, opioid crisis and how it made it such, so much worse. We started seeing uh, some projected numbers that were gonna break our, our record number of overdose drug deaths. And there's, you know, state by state. If you scroll up a little bit, Chris, you see the map. And then you can click on a state and you can see the current projected. And I know it sounds kind of old if you're going back to October 2020, um, but it, 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 it's played out. We, we have even more current data in West Virginia, and this has played out to be spot on uh, the numbers. You can see the percentage increase from the previous 12 month period compared to this current 12 month past 12 months and it's kind of, you know it's again it's updated every month it gives you a real good uh way to track and i think um what was i think washington dc had the highest percentage increase well kentucky was up there and, and west virginia was fourth and colorado for some reason was also in the top four 
I don't know if that's still the case for this particular, but when I looked looked at it a while back, yeah, Colorado, 42 point something percentage. That's a big change. Um, but these numbers have, have played out to be very similar to our health statistics center. Um, and that's uh, that's also a, a tip that you can uh, you can look at your you can contact your your Department of Health and Human Services people and see if they can get you you know what they have we have spreadsheets here we actually have a month by month thing here too that you can look at not just overdose deaths but at overdoses just you know people who live and people who die uh, from overdoses just total number of overdose that have been responded to by paramedics and that's usually comes out like a month after so that's during the pandemic i think in august 2020 we saw the may or the july and june numbers and they were just through the roof they were like seven times higher than normal um to kind of wrap up um i we have this uh what i said earlier a bellwether trial and everything's filed through pacer and I know PACER is a paid site, but I use um, what's called portlistener.com. And I have the docket number and everything for this case because a lot of the materials used in this case are being used in cases all across the country. And everything is filed. I have an alert system where I can spot um, you know, what's been filed. And Court Listener is if somebody has opened the document in PACER before, only if they've opened it, and I guess I guess you have to and buy and bought it, you can actually get all this stuff for free. And frankly, I've been opening a lot of stuff on Pacer, so probably you can piggyback on what I open and get it get it for free. But this will this will you know have I don't even know how many where's it thirteen I see that thirteen hundred some documents, <laughs> so it's it's a lot of uh, materials, but it's a way to keep track of of the case. Um, we're hearing there's going to be, they announced last year a global $26 billion settlement with the distributors and one manufacturer. And we're hearing that uh, that might be finalized sometimes next week. This case here has been carved out from that case because they didn't, the, the lawyers here didn't think that, it, or, the, that, or the mayors and the county commissioners didn't think that that was enough they were going to get enough money. I think West Virginia was just going to get 160 million from the global settlement. So um, that's that's something to keep an eye out for. And just about every state has some involvement in this uh, these lawsuits against the the distributors and the manufacturers. There's actually a case in California ongoing now um, against just against manufacturers, which because of this case I haven't been following, but I think that's going to say a lot to see what happens there. We were really surprised that these didn't settle. Um, I, you know, you know, I was told on day one it was a coin flip. I talked to the lawyer last night of the Huntington uh, case, and uh, he said that there could be a settlement on this one, but he's not sure, um, or he wouldn't say, or he wouldn't tell me at least. So um, that's 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 kind of the end of the presentation. Um, one thing I left out is, and because I really can fit on one page, but there is data about CDC data about total prescriptions by population. And during this case, we haven't seen it yet, but we were told that the, in the uh, California case that they've gotten uh, a new data set. I think it's from some company called Incovia that uh, you can actually see like by state, who is your number one prescriber of prescription opioids over a course of several years? And you can you know, rank doctors and see the doctors. That information has always been available on what they call um, controlled substance monitoring program, or they call them things different in each state, but that's, that's been available, but they just, um, you can't get it if you're the public or the press. There's exceptions to releasing that, that data, but uh, that, that Coming down the pike, that might be something to really take a look at. You know, who are the top prescribers in your state? So back to you, Chris, to talk okay. to the great Charlotte 
this move. All right. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Great data sources. Um, we'll we'll have time for questions with Eric after we've heard from Charlotte. Um, but thanks for those links. Uh, you all should have a copy of the document that Alyssa has sent out that has the links. And so you can, if you haven't gotten that, just let us know. So let's turn it over to Charlotte, who's going to talk about the legal side of things. Hi, everyone. I'm really honored and totally starstruck to be here with Eric and Beth. And I've um, so thank you for having me. Uh, of course, as a former attorney, I committed the sin of making a PowerPoint. I hope you'll bear with me. And uh, just know that because of the time, it is both very narrow and very general. Um, if you ever need any further information or you have questions, I'll give you my contact information at the end as well. Um, so I am not a journalist. I'm a former Manhattan assistant district attorney. I uh, began working on opioid related issues as a felony narcotics prosecutor when we realized that um, actually the most heinous crimes being committed in the five boroughs of New York were being committed by doctors. And specifically, um, I worked on the case of one doctor, Dr. Stanley, and he's um, the one that I wrote about in the book. Uh, so the book really talks about the prosecution, the investigation, um, and a lot of the people involved. But what I wanted to do here was to um, go from a notion that I had when I wrote the book, which is why does one case matter or teach us anything? And the reason is that a lot of the issues that we encountered in the Dr. Lee case, I've actually seen reflected on a macro level with the big, um, the big lawsuits and the bigger prosecutions. And there's one issue in particular, the issue of causation that I think is worth introducing to you. And I think that once you have it in your mind, it will never leave, but it'll grow in a beautiful way. So um, let me start by a chart. And I deliberately hand wrote my charts. Um, as Beth knows, I use drawings a lot uh, because I think it makes, um, anyway, it's just the way I think. I think visually one of you asked before, a very important question, which is when a topic is really, really thorny, what do you do? I do turn to experts, but I also turn a lot to um, drawing because I find that by trying to sketch out a topic that I don't know anything about, there's a way that visually it comes together. So that's one thing that I would recommend. So if we're thinking about the, um, we hear these days about so many opioid cases and the fact is that they all fit together. And I think that if you have a picture of how they're fitting together in your mind, it'll help you sort of understand why they're important. There are two categories of cases, the civil cases and the criminal cases. An example of the civil case of a civil case would be the multi-district litigation, which is actually a collection of more than a thousand. I think it's 1400 civil cases that have been brought and all got pulled into one federal court in Ohio. And then on the other side, you have criminal prosecutions. And I'm sure you've all heard about the prosecution of John Kapoor, who was the CEO of INSYS. So that's an example of those cases. And then uh, who brings these different cases? And forgive me if any of you have legal background and this is way too basic. Um, I always find it useful to, to go back to this, but uh, I hope you'll, you'll bear with me. Um, on the civil side, individuals, of course, bring lawsuits, personal injury claims, but also you have government entities like states, cities, or counties. Um, and they're bringing claims under tort law, which is the law of when somebody does something wrong to you um, or negligence, um, tribal entities as well, but also the federal government has the capacity through individual US attorney's offices um, to bring civil claims as well. On the criminal side, you do also have state attorney generals. So they also have the ability to bring both civil and criminal cases, but then you have local prosecutors. Um, so somebody like me who worked for uh, the New York County DA's office, um, we had the ability to bring criminal charges. The, well, I'll, I'll get to the, the jurisdiction in our case. Um, and of course, the uh, Department of Justice, federal prosecutors there as well. So let's just think for a second about the civil universe. Yes, this is a <laughs> possibly um, terrifying chart, but I assure you that uh, it'll, it'll give you, I think, a, a simple enough map. Um, so the way to think about it is that there are two homes for civil lawsuits. There's 
a home in state court. So as you know, we have state court systems that are unique to each state and that apply the law of those states, which is different from federal law. Um, and then you have the federal court system, which is a nationwide system of district courts supervised by um, circuit, circuit courts. So there are people who um, can bring a case in state court, but who can't necessarily keep it there. If you're an individual, just a regular person, and you bring a case in state court, and that case happens like so many of the opioid cases to have issues of fact and defendants um, and you know actors in common with other cases across the nation, you might get, you can get pulled by one of your defendants into federal court. And that's what happened to a lot of the MDL cases. So um, individuals filed civil lawsuits in their home state courts and their, you know, their neighboring courts, and they got all pulled together into federal court. And then once in federal court, they all got pulled together into the MDL. The multi-district litigation is a tool that federal courts use to consolidate and make more efficient, allegedly, um, the, uh, the handling of cases. There are a couple of options that can occur once your case is in an MDL. The trial, the case can be remanded, that means sent back to its home court for trial. That, the original sort of stated purpose of the MDL was to do that. It's turned out that that's a very, very remote and rare occurrence. Um, a lot of legal scholars, there's actually been a really, really good paper written recently about how bringing back the remand function would make the MDL much more fair to um, individual people because of course, it's much harder, uh, you know, if you're just a regular person up against these massive corporate defendants, you get pulled into federal court and the next thing you know, your case is in Ohio um, and you're being represented by an attorney whom you've never met, that's, you know, the, it's unfair. Um, you're not on equal footing. And so the, the initial notion of the MDL was that the cases would be processed together up to a certain point. They would, people would share discovery, they would share evidence, you'd get some of the basic issues out of the way, and then you would send it back to the home court for trial on the, you know, the, the sort of remaining issues. That rarely happens. What happens instead is what's happening in the case that Eric is covering, for instance, which is that the judge in the MDL, Judge Polster, designates a couple of cases in each track. That by the track, they mean, um, you know, they're sort of different categories of cases, cases against distributors, cases against manufacturers, cases against pharmacies. And in each of those tracks, they'll select one, two, or three cases that seem to be very representative of the others. And those are sent back for trial. And those are called bellwether cases because the way they go is the way we expect the bigger case to go. Uh, and so they're intended to give a sense of sort of what the mood is in the courtroom with regard to the issues that are on trial. In parallel to this, there are settlement discussions. So there's a negotiation class that includes everybody in the MDL, and it also includes state actors. So looking quickly at the other side, so civilians can get pulled into federal court and have their case moved into the MDL. But if you're a state attorney general and you bring a case in your home court, you're not gonna get moved into federal court. You have a right to stay in your home court. So those are the cases, for instance, the California case that you've heard about in Orange County. That is a case that began in state court and is staying in state court. However, those actors are also part of the settlement class. Okay. So this is sort of the universe that we're talking about. Now I'm going to step back, take you back into the criminal side. Um, and let me just make sure I'm doing on time. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is talk to you quickly about the case that I prosecuted. So um, there is obviously a, you know, a life cycle to each case. Our case took four years from uh, the beginning to sentencing. These cases are very long. They're very resource intensive. Um, with these slides, I'm not going to go through and read every bullet point, but the, you know, the slide deck can be available later if you need it. The areas that I'm going to focus on today are um, understanding the criminal conduct and some of the legal theories of prosecution. So uh, we conducted a very long investigation 
And our investigation actually um, was launched by a tip, I think like many of your cases. And of course, the work that follows that is uh, intense. Uh, we used what Eric described earlier, the controlled substance review databases that what's called in New York State, the PMDP. We issued subpoenas for that. That was one of our first steps. Um, we had confidential informants. We used surveillance. We really deployed every resource possible um, to try to understand the conduct. And this is the, the tip as we received it. It was a teeny tiny post-it note that my boss handed me one night. Um, and the complainant had told, Stephen Jones was actually the detective on the case. And the complaint uh, as it presented was that a doctor was prescribing medications to kids who didn't need it. And that's all we had to begin with. I'm gonna show you a video um, this video is not from the heyday of the clinic. So uh, this video is from a uh, security camera located in on the basement floor of where Dr. Lee's office was located. What it's going to show you is um, the types of numbers that we were dealing with uh, among his patients. So he ran this office only one day a week on the weekend. He in his heyday saw up to 100 patients a day. But um, what we learned was that when they first opened in the morning, there was a line of patients who were waiting outside the door. And what you're gonna see now is those patients coming in and going down the hall towards his office. And that's his receptionist who's walking up ahead, uh, who's just opened the lobby door. So one of the issues is that over two and a half years with these kinds of numbers, so up to 100 patients a day um, coming in to buy prescriptions, cash only business, what is related to that is a lot of deaths. We identified 16 overdose deaths associated with his clinic. And ultimately we prosecuted Dr. Lee for his role in two of those deaths. So again, this is, you know, this is the crowd sort of near the tail end of his business just before we shut him down first thing in the morning. Oops. We used the PMDP to get a sense of what the prescriptions, what he was writing, what he was selling. Over two and a half years, he wrote 20, over 21,000 prescriptions, which is more than some physicians will write um, you know, of controlled substances in a career. 56% of those were oxycodone and what's significant is that you see the smaller share for Xanax, but actually those were usually paired together. So that's a very, very high risk combination. We were also able to use the data um, and uh, other sources to track down where Dr. Lee's patients were coming from. So one of the things, you know, one of the themes in our prosecution that I wanted to share with you was that even the small cases matter so much because they have such a huge and wide impact, not only geographically, but from a human standpoint, 16 overdose deaths, um, you know, several states involved. And so it really gave me an understanding of what the opioid epidemic was made up of, which is individual tragedies. Um, this is a letter that we found in the patient files uh, I am sure that Beth and Eric have seen many of these, and I think some of you who cover this beat may have as well. Um, it's one of many letters that parents sent to this doctor to warn him. This letter actually ended up giving us um, a lot of tips. You see there are a lot of people who are CC'd at the bottom. Um, there's information in here about what uh, the writer's son was doing. So we use this as a way to establish that the doctor was aware of the risk to his other patients, but we also used it as a way to try to understand, well, who else knew about this? Who else could have done something to stop it? Um, where else do we need to reach out? Okay, so these are really the three key issues that we encountered, foreseeability, good faith, and causation. Um, and of course, these are the issues that are so prevalent in every single one of these lawsuits where the question is not just what was the harm that was done, but who is responsible for the harm? Foreseeability is a basic threshold and that is something that, you know, I'm sure as Eric has seen this week is being fought tooth and nail. Um, you know, how could we have known that people would take these medications other than as prescribed? How could we have known 
that the pharmacy or the physician was, um, you know, was uh, selling them improperly. Um, then there's the question of good faith. Did they really exercise the, the controls that they had? Were they aware that there were deaths occurring and just putting that to the side or were they really operating in a sort of a absolutely impossible in my opinion, good faith vacuum. Um, and then of course there's the issue of causation. So if you think of a chain link between the cause and the effect, between a manufacturer pressing out a pill and a death, um, there are many, many links in that chain and the chain can be shorter or longer depending on what the issue is. So um, that is the issue of causation uh, that is so, so important. And in our case, what we had to show was that the physician knew that there was a risk to his patients and he consciously disregarded that risk. And I think that you are gonna hear that theme being repeated. Um, these are some of the lines from the defense attorney in our case that I think will sound very familiar to you as well. Stigmatizing the patients, foreseeability, we never knew that they would take them other than as prescribed. And then of course, turning the tables right? Um, the addicts, the so-called addicts are the ones who are misleading the physicians and the manufacturers, et cetera, and not the other way around. Um, it's, I still find it very upsetting, very offensive. I think it's very important to counter that narrative. Um, now, this is, uh, oops, sorry. Unfortunately, it's a narrative that is very, very prevalent. Um, all the way into the bankruptcy. So the bankruptcy, the Purdue bankruptcy was a case that was taken out of the MDL uh, when Purdue filed for bankruptcy. Um, this is my caricature of the judge. Again, I usually process information with drawings. So I have this little drawing of him that I use to express complicated legal notions. Um, and this was something that he actually said during a hearing, which was, well, why do all these people wanna take Purdue to trial? You'd have to show causation and introduce evidence as though that were a losing battle to begin with. And indeed, um, we recently saw the presentations that uh, the members of the Sackler family put together um, to preview the kinds of defenses that they would raise. Again, I think these are probably extremely familiar to those of you covering the other opioid cases, but it's causation. How could we have known? This was not what we intended. These drugs were misused. Um, there were rogue actors, and uh, that is really the, you know, the the theories that have to be um, uh, undermined, or the defenses that have to be undermined using the data and using all of the information that was aware of them. Um, oops, sorry. I think I am, Chris. I think I'm out of time. Okay. I mean, we, did you have, have how many more slides do you have? Uh, I can I can stop here. Okay. Actually, I have I have like two more, but I can stop if. Okay. The, well. Um, yeah. yeah but, um, all right. So well, we have we have plenty of time for questions. I see we have a, a one in chat from Barbara. Barbara, could you just uh, ask that ask that one, and then others raise your hands, and we'll have time for Q and A. Absolutely. Hi, Charlotte. A great talk this afternoon. Um, my question is, I was reading that you have a portion of the sales from your book, The Fed Up Coalition. Can you tell us more about that and why you back that coalition you're aiming to do? Uh, thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate it. Um, so, and I think this may respond to a couple of earlier questions as well. Um, I was really, really haunted during this case. I met with so many families who had you know, lost a child or a sister or um, a father. And uh, I met with a lot of survivors and I had never, you know, I'd never prosecuted a homicide before. Um, there was a long learning curve for me and I really felt like I was taking on a very serious responsibility given that this was a novel prosecution theory that we were one of the first, we were the first in New York state to bring a manslaughter case against a doctor. I couldn't give the families any guarantees. And so I really just, um, I felt very haunted by these deaths and by you know the sense of responsibility that I had. And I think um, as with Beth and Eric, I have received many, many messages from people reaching out and saying, you know, I know a doctor who uh, 
prescribe to you know somebody that I love, they're in trouble or they're dead. And I always felt like I wanted a place to refer them to. When I met Emily Walden, who's the director of Fed Up, she told me, you know, if you ever speak to a family member in distress, just give them my cell phone number. Um, and that is what Fed Up is about. In addition to the advocacy work that they do to try to prevent, um, well, to try to stop the opioid epidemic, but also prevent something similar from ever happening again, they're just there to support families. It's a coalition of groups founded by families. And so I really believe in their mission. And um, unfortunately, I think there's still a lot of work to do. So that's why I decided to partner with them. Okay, next question to Kyle. Uh, Eric, I was curious, and, and thank you for all the, the resources. Having something actually compiled into a manageable, searchable database is, is a luxury we don't always have. And, and um, having spent a, a little too much time on snipe hunts going through campaign finance documentation, I'm curious what strategies you use when it's not so nicely coordinated to, um, you know, to keep, keep your mind uh, processing or, or keep things at hand and accessible when you're going through a giant trove of data that might not be cleanly sorted. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the guy that's going to clean and sort, you know, I can sort. I mean, on the West Virginia stuff, it was just a simple search and sort. Um, yeah, we were, we were kind of hit blindsided when the judge, when the judge under pressure from the, obviously from the decision, not under pressure, but because of the decision in the appeals court, um, he, they released this 500 million uh, data set. And, you know, we didn't know, we, I, I tried to open it up here and it was a joke and then somebody else and we kind of went, we even went to ProPublica and, and they had nothing, no equipment to open it. Um, so, um, I don't know, I, I mean, it, we paid 3 million I mean, when I say we, I mean, technically the taxpayers are going to be paying $3 million for this data set. That's, and, and again, it's from the plaintiff, so you got to be a little bit cautious, but you can compare that to the Washington Post numbers. But what was your specific question, Kyle? Well, I guess, I guess my question is, especially when you've got so many numbers and it'd be easy to, to get lost in, in just a, a series of zeros, ones, sevens, nines, et cetera, how, what techniques do you use to, to keep it clear in, in your head? I mean, is it a giant whiteboard? Is it, is it you know, some kind of uh, note-taking system? How do, you, how do you make sure that after combing through stuff and finding the figures you want, you don't then have everything lost in the, in the shuffle, so to speak? What do you do to, to keep yeah. everything straight? I mean, I, when I do a project, this is applied to the project, I have a piece of paper and I draw, or not a paper, but uh, on Google Doc, I draw a line in the middle of kind of key findings and and then below there what I need what I need to get. So when I get, you know, I'm looking over data and I say, wow, um, you know, look at this, uh, three million prescription hydrocodone and oxycodone in one year at this town of, you know, a thousand, two thousand people. And I'll just put that in the top part of the uh, the Google Doc that I have that's you know, we'll just make some sort of declaration. Uh, what the data shows um and then uh, and then questions that i'm going to be asking of the data i put in, in below the line and then i just keep filtering stuff up and what happens once you get you know a series of uh things that that you know you can write in a, in a sentence it almost becomes like an outline um wow but, but, you know just you just start and you got to be careful because like I guess as i said earlier i mean numbers can really drag a story down if you have too many so um but in this case when you've got you know like uh, you know it was one well my story said seven seven hundred and eighty million opioid pills when you add another couple of years it was one billion opioid pills for a state of 1.8 million that tells you a lot hey eric but, yeah could, could you tell the story about how you wrote the Pulitzer winning story in, I think it was just one week. It was like and three, three weeks. Three weeks. Okay. And, but, but I did have, but didn't you have a stories. bunch of bo a box of stuff appeared on your front porch and maybe that would be a neat way to talk, answer his question as well. Like, how did you make a story that fast of such importance? 
Well, we, we actually got the data. We found it was in the West Virginia Attorney General's office that had been delivered by the DEA back in 2015. So it had been there for sitting there doing nothing for two years. And we used um, Freedom of Information Act and a threat of a lawsuit to pry loose those numbers. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking when I say this. I mean, just about everybody here if you were presented with this data set from West Virginia, you all would have all won a Pulitzer Prize because, <laughs> I mean, it was just damning and it was just, it, 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 you know, it was DEA data, but again, it was the drug companies who report their pill sales to the DEA. So there's no way they could refute what, what the companies had, had reported, which typically, you know, there's other, you know, there'd been some wiggle room to, you know, say this or that. Um, and I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I only had one other reporter went through it and found the same things. And what we were looking for is, um, you know, were the counties with the highest number of opioid pills, the counties that ha had the highest number of overdose deaths. And I, I'm sure there wasn't a direct uh, correlation, but um, for the most part, the, the same counties that had the highest number of opioid pills per person had the highest number of drug overdose deaths per person. Here's a story here. So yeah. uh, next question to Madeline. Hi guys, thank you so much uh, for coming to talk with us. Uh, as you know, we, we've been doing this fellowship um, all last month, you know, we've heard from a lot of different people uh, with a lot of different story ideas of, of research that's going on right now and kind of the solutions. Uh, but there are so many different kinds of stories out there um, as far as access to different kinds of medications, um, stigma around getting those medications and giving those medications, um, even just the types of drugs in each region. I'm part of the Mountain West News Bureau, so that's the Inner Mountain West, uh, and we don't have as much of an opioid problem, but it's there, especially in, in Denver and Colorado. Uh, but we have meth abuse and a bunch of other things. I guess the question that I'd like to ask is, is for you guys, how do you drill down into what you think is most necessary to report on in the moment? Because um, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm not an, just an, an addiction reporter. I'm more of a general assignment reporter for an entire region. Um, so yeah, I mean, if any advice you can give would be, I'd be very grateful to hear it. <laughs> um, I'll start. Um, it sounds like you have pretty good sources. So I would go to the people who can get you to the layer of, of on the ground. Um, people who have innovated new treatment methodologies, whether it's a doctor who's like FaceTiming with a community health worker in a homeless encampment and what is she learning? Um, maybe it's a social worker. I mean, I find that the people who, um, are the most passionate about this are people who have lost loved ones or had it in their family. Um, and then you see a lot of really cool stories coming out of harm reduction. So, I mean, if you spent a day at a needle exchange, I guarantee you, you come away with about five stories. Like, so you're gonna get the story about math. You're also, if you talk to people, you're gonna get the story about how hard it is to get on their MAT. Um, I still think readers don't understand the difference between buprenorphine, naltrexone, methadone. I mean, uh, uh, somebody told me recently, it, we should write a 20 page article about buprenorphine because like, it's such a basic life-saving thing. And, and like you see, even editors eyes glaze over. So one of the things I'm doing with my new book is I'm doing an author's note at the beginning saying, I'm not using the word addicts and I'm saying why I'm not. And here's the difference. Here's the, uh, here's, I'm gonna write about these really important medicines, but I wanna get the acronyms out of the way, right? But, but that sort of signals to the reader that this it sounds wonky, but it's really, really important. And, um, and then similarly with like law enforcement, because you see so much cycling in and out of jail, people get on probation, then they relapse because their addiction hasn't been treated. Um, how can you get at that story? So, you know, um, sources, and, and you can get at those from both sides. You can get it from the law enforcement angle, defense attorneys, but also from the families themselves. I mean, families are so fed up with this. And, um, 
And, and I would encourage you to, to start asking really hard questions of people running the law enforcement, of largely elected officials. Like, why does this, this sheriff over here offer MOUD, but you don't? And, and why is that? And they'll say, well, my constituents don't want me to be soft on crime. You know, well, really? Because this survey says we don't think you're handling it well enough. I mean, you can, there are surveys, they're more national in scope. I'm not saying it's going to be in the Mountain West, but I mean, I think we really need to ask hard questions of the people who are supposed to be helping these people. I mean, one cool thing that's happened here in Roanoke, and it was partly because of, of Tessa's story, that the ER uh, in our big nonprofit hospital, uh, which is the largest employer in town, has a lot of power. But I wrote over and over about how she was always like she was treated for an abscess she was treated for an overdose and just like the biggest treatment they had was here's a list of aa na meetings well sorry just doesn't work in general for people with opioid use disorder it certainly didn't help her and when i interviewed the head of the ed he said we don't think it's our job i think it's just treating a drug with another drug well two years later he decided to do the research on his own, and he is now the number one evangelist for getting waiver to do buprenorphine in the ED. And in a month's time, he had like 56 new patients that he'd gone over into the bridge clinic. And I said, what's that feel like? It feels like doing cartwheels every day, mental cartwheels. He's excited about his job. And so if you can find those evangelists in your community, and they're out there, they can help you know, when he says that, other doctors will listen to him, right? So, I, I mean, I think there's just so many stories we can be telling right now. Okay, Charlotte, you want to add into that? Sure, yes. I also think there are stories of people who are <coughs> trying to be heard and trying to be a part of the legal processes going on and who are being shut out. And that's something that I'm really, um, you know, upset by, obsessed with, uh, that I think has become very, very clear in the Purdue bankruptcy and other um, and other proceedings you see on the dockets. And for instance, in the Purdue bankruptcy, if you go to prime clerk, you Google prime clerk Purdue bankruptcy, you go on the docket and do a, a word search for the word letter. And you are going to find dozens of letters from people who are incarcerated, from people who have lost loved ones who say, I don't understand what's going on. I lost someone or I lost years of my life um, you know, this changed my life and judge, can I please be heard? Um, what we've heard during the hearings is that the judge never seems to think there's a good time to deal with those requests or those questions and they're just piling up on the docket. So I think that reaching out to those people um, and, you know, really making it clear that there are, there are those who have access to the judicial system right now and there are those who are being left out and what is it that they are asking for? Um, how can we have them involved and, you know, uh, participate in a way that is equitable? Um, I mean, the, you know, the number of incarcerated people who have, whose lives have taken a different track because of the crimes committed by corporate and white collar criminals and who now are not being represented in these legal processes is absolutely outrageous. Um, and they are invisible right now to the attorneys and judges in those cases. So um, I, you know, I would urge you to take a look at that. And, uh, you know, these stories are really, they're important. Okay. So um, it's 1.30 right now, but Andrea has her hand up. So let's just go a couple extra minutes and get Andrea's question. And, and we probably have time for one more also beyond that. So Andrea? Great, thank you. I'm Andrea DeLeon and I work for NPR. Um, I am sort of thinking about the moment that we are in, not just with um, pharmaceutical drugs, but more broadly with the addiction and drug abuse epidemic that we have had, you know, everything from meth to, you know, illegally made fentanyl that's coming into the country. And whether we're at a moment of change, we're seeing prohibition ending in places, we're seeing reductions in numbers of people incarcerated, we are seeing more treatment options for those who can actually get tre treatment. So I just want to know what stories you think we're going to be telling in a couple of years and whether those little things feel like they add up to anything of any hope, actually. <laughs> I, 
I think there's some hope there, but I think these stories of um, prohibition ending in places and, you know, people being let out of jail. I mean, I just still think these are outliers more than, I write a lot about rural America. These things are not happening there at all. Um, but I am hopeful because I'm starting to see little changes happen. It's frustrating after writing about this for over 10 years that it's not at the pace I would like. And I'm trying to figure out what stories I can tell that would help provoke or ease that pace along. But, 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 but it is hard. And, I, and the reason I'm telling the, my next book the way I am is because I, I want to write about the hopeful. Um, I don't know if you know Martha Biminger. Uh, uh, yeah, she's one of my best friends, but she said, you know, she calls everybody honey. She, when she's the <laughs> one that made me- I know her well. <laughs> I don't have time for a panic attack. And she was right, but she said, honey, you might, I said, it's just so dark. And she said, honey, you might need to make it seem more hopeful than it is. And that was such a moving thing. Um, and in some ways she's right, because like my experience reporting in Virginia and North Carolina and other places in Appalachia are so dark compared to like, she took me on a couple of days up in Boston and it's just night and day. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of, for those of you who aren't in big cities, there's just a lot of light you need to be shining. Um, any final thoughts or final questions? I would just add to that. Um, I think the stories we should tell are those are the people making very healthy trouble right now. I'm not, I'm not in a hopeful phase yet. I'm in a phase of trying to break the glass and open things up and uh, you know, um, open up these very uh, obtuse legal proceedings to the public and to public understanding and allowing people to have a voice in them. So um, there are a lot of attorneys uh, there's just one pro bono attorney in the Purdue bankruptcy case. There are, you know, attorneys um, who are, work for the state or elsewhere who are really doing incredible work trying to uh, trying to rectify these wrongs, and they are the minority, um, and they are very, very much being squelched by the big money. So I hope that we'll see stories about them. Well, with that, we will draw this session to a close. Eric, Beth, and Charlotte, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to come and talk with our fellows. It's been a great way to end our fellowship, learning from some writers who have figured out how to, how to merge the numbers and the people and the law in a way that has made for some very compelling work from all three of you.